Okay, let's get started. Welcome to today's webcast by Portfolio BI, covering trade allocations and compliance best practice. Thank you for joining myself, Craig Fitzpatrick, Business Development at Portfolio BI, and our two subject matter experts, Greg Mechanic, Partner, ACA Compliance Group, and Johan Glasman, Managing Director, Head of Product at Portfolio BI. Ahead of diving into today's session, we'd like to review a few housekeeping items. Today's event should run approximately 30 minutes. We have allocated some time at the end of the session for Q&A. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see three icons, chat, raise hand, and Q&A. Please submit questions via Q&A as you think of them, and we'll get to them at the end of the session. If we don't get to your question, we'll follow up with you after the webinar and make sure we answer it for you. If you have any technical issues during the event, please hit raise hand, and a member of the Portfolio BI team will be in touch with you momentarily. If you miss anything, don't worry. We'll be recording today's session and we'll make it available after the webinar. At Portfolio BI, our team is comprised of business experts and we help clients mitigate risk through technology, risks such as operational risk, compliance risk, and market volatility. Our mission is to help firms see, share, and make informed decisions quickly. Since we've recently seen a renewed SEC focus on fair and equitable trade allocations, today's event, we're going to cover the rules under the Advisors Act, as well as technology best practice to ensure your firm is complying with SEC expectations. Let's get started. Just to recap, again, my name is Craig Fitzpatrick. I'm a Managing Director of Business Development at Portfolio BI, and I've been in the financial technology industry for more than 20 years. Johan? Hi, I'm Johan Glasman. I'm the head of product at Portfolio BI. I've been with the company for 14 years and in the finance and software consulting space for over 20 years. My role as head of product is to drive product strategy, engage with partners, kick off client implementations, and in general, act as a subject matter expert. And Greg. Hi all, great to be with you today. Hope everyone had a good uh, and safe end of the summer. I'm Greg Mechanic, I'm a partner in ACA's regulatory consulting practice. I've been with ACA for about 13 years and help clients solve compliance issues on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, in addition to some business development responsibilities. Great, thanks Greg. So let's get started. Greg, since you're an expert uh, in the compliance field, can you please provide the audience with an overview of the SEC rules, uh, interpretations, and expectations around trade allocations? Yeah, sure. Although rules, um, you know, where we're, where we're going, we need no rules. Um, and what I mean by that is there are no specific rules under the Advisors Act that address trade allocations. Um, you know, however, advisors are fiduciaries, as we all know, and they owe each of their clients equally uh, the same fiduciary duty. And with that comes um, uh, an obligation to act in a, in a fair and equitable manner. Um, in addition, SEC examiners will always point to the compliance program rule if they find issues in this space, which of course requires advisors to adopt policies and procedures to mitigate their compliance risks. So while there are really no rules, there are three expectations when it comes to the rules of the road for allocating trades. Uh, first, advisors cannot favor themselves over any or any single client for that matter over another client. And there are many reasons why, you know, a trade may be allocated to one client over another. It could be investment mandate, it could be available cash, risk tolerance, accounts ramping up, for, for example. These are all reasons that are generally okay with adequate thought, documentation, and reasoning. Um, you know, keep in mind the, the examiners have the benefit of hindsight, right? So. Um, they also have the benefit in, in 2020 of sophisticated technology, really unlike we've ever seen before. And that allows for systematic anomaly detection in the trade allocation process, among other areas of the compliance program. The second thing that um, I want to touch on is disclosures. Uh, disclosures are extremely important when it comes to mid gain conflicts of interest. And really, if you're not allocating your trades on a pro rata basis across accounts, the allocation process can create at least the appearance of a conflict of interest. 
Um, disclosures to clients and investors is really key to mitigating that conflict of interest. And those can reside in a number of different places depending on the size and the, the structure, and the complexity of the advisor. Generally, what we see is the Form ADV Part 2A is, is the most appropriate place, however. Um, I would also add that while disclosures are expected of regulators, it's not only important for regulators, right? Uh, your clients and investors want to know and understand how you as an investment advisor will allocate their trades. If they have investment restrictions, for example, will they always get allocated last or will they trade last in rotation? These are important things to include in, in disclosures. And they need to be consistent with written policies and procedures. And so the last one I wanna talk on is consistency. The systematic allocation of trades is really ideal. I mean, this can take many different forms from detailed policies and procedures that include workflow diagrams for various allocation scenarios based off the investment strategies to uh, more sophisticated compliance engines, which is kind of, you know, in, in Johan's perspective, uh, you know, these, these are layered on to sophisticated order management systems. We'll, we'll touch a bit on that more, more later on today. Great, thanks, Greg. So now let's take a look at it from more of a, a practical standpoint, now that we have a, a good understanding of the rule or lack thereof. Uh, so from your experience, can, can you talk a little bit about what's typically included in a pre-examination request list from a trade allocation standpoint? Yeah, so it's interesting, just like the Advisors Act, they're not going, you know, in, in a routine SEC examination, I think that probably a, a just a point to clarify, you know, let's assume that there's no pre-existing issue that's been ident identified and this is a, a four cause examination. But in the routine course, you know, advisors are unlikely to receive a request list that asks for, you know, particular trades in their allocations. Um, so what, what is requested is very dependent on the examination team and the type of firm. Generally, firms will get a transaction blotter request, a, a request for a list of clients, their investment mandate, you know, the type of client, whether it's an institutional separately managed account or a retail account or a private fund, and then the advisor agreements or private placement memoranda that goes with those accounts. And then, of course, policies and procedures that were in place during the exam period, not just related to trade allocation, but certainly including trade allocation. And then they'll ask for other things in the routine course, like a list of IPOs and secondaries and how they were allocated, you know, profitable positions and, and least profitable positions, monthly performance across client accounts, similar client accounts. And then they take all this information and they piece it together to begin their process of reviewing trade allocations, you know, among, among other things. Great. Thanks, Greg. So, Johan, let's take a look at this from a technologist perspective. So when you have to produce these items uh, for the SEC, you know, how do you do that? Can you elaborate on that, please? Sure. So for firms that have a simple tech footprint, this uh, it should be as simple as opening your OMS or accounting system, pulling up, you know, a list of trades and, and allocations, putting that together and and sending it out. Um, and if it is simple, if the asset types being traded are pretty straightforward, this can be pretty easy to produce, although it does tend to require some, you know, some data massaging uh, in any case, because nothing is ever that simple. Once anything gets more complicated, uh, we have firms, uh, clients that have multiple OMS, uh, or they might have had an OMS historically and uh, transitioned onto another one. Uh, sometimes trades need to be booked in ways that are not 100% uh, straightforward uh, in multiple legs or, um, you know, or, or, or different other categories. And then it can become a challenge. Where things can get difficult, time consuming and error prone is if different systems or different security types within the same systems have inconsistent trading categorization or other challenges around mapping and labeling. Uh, all of this stuff can be resolved by the right technology choices and uh, operational processes. And it's probably a good idea to, uh, you know, to check to see how well you can produce this ahead of time before somebody asks. Thanks, Johan. And Greg, since you've worked with hundreds of managers either preparing for exams or going through exams or just putting together their compliance program. How long does it typically take an investment manager to put these items together for an SEC uh, examination? Uh, obviously, there are some variables that go into that, but I'll let you elaborate. 
Yeah, I mean, like you said, this this obviously varies from firm to firm based off of the the you know the differing investment mandates, the, the strategies that they have. I mean, that that said, firms that use technology to help with allocations will likely have an audit trail of what was done and why. And you know, just as important as, as having that documentation, it's easy to to pull and provide to to regulators or, or really anybody that that's requesting it, you know, internally or externally. Firms that that don't use technology to perform their allocation processes, uh, or you know, maybe even more challenging to document how they allocate and why, are likely to to struggle with providing allocation rationale at some point in the future. I mean, keep in mind, examiners will follow up with specific trade requests on individual trades, asking why that particular trade was allocated and why. That's that's unlikely to come as part of the initial document request, as as mentioned earlier. Uh, but it will likely come you know, during the uh, examination process. If that is stuck in a, you know, a hard copy trade ticket, as we've seen in the past, or even a Bloomberg chat or an email or some other document, it's much more difficult to get that information to examiners. And that length of time that it might take will give examiners some pause. Great. Thanks, Greg. So moving on, the attached was taken from a, a recent SEC administrative proceeding. Uh, the investment advisor unfairly allocated trades and had an inadequate compliance program. Greg, for the audience, can you provide some additional color on what happened here? Yeah, I mean, this case reinforces basically everything we've said thus far around policies and procedures. This, this firm failed. Um, in, in multiple aspects. They weren't following, following their policies and procedures, their disclosures weren't accurate, plus they were cherry picking trades to allocate to certain day trading clients, which essentially gave them free options on these trades. Uh, with all that said, I mean, you've got a, a bit of a, uh, Craig, you're a baseball guy, I think, four, six, three, triple play, like in the bad way, right? Um, you, you know, so coming out of this, and this was not a large investment advisor, so anybody can get tripped up you know, in their trade allocation process. But this firm had to hire an independent compliance consultant. They had to conduct an independent review. They had to submit the report and the findings to the SEC. On top of that, they had to pay a $100,000 civil penalty. I mean, this is not a, a huge penalty in the grand scheme of things, but for the size of the advisor, it's pretty detrimental. Great, thanks, Greg. Okay, let's move on to uh, some technology questions. Uh, Johan, You've been a technologist for more than 20 years. You've led professional services consulting engagements around order management implementations for, for many of those years. What are some common technology deficiencies uh, that you've seen? Yeah, so, uh, you know, as, as I've been working in this industry, what I tend to see is that, um, you know, the, the market changes over time and um, new security types come on uh, new kind of paradigms of how people invest happen and systems that were built to kind of go operate in the old way tend to lag behind in certain functions. And that's kind of hard for, you know, the C-suite of a fund sometimes to really have a grasp on, you know, well, we have an OMS, don't we? It handles allocations, doesn't it? Uh, and then what you find is, yeah, you could be a fund where your allocation policy is really straightforward. And the systems uh, can, you know, can handle the basic, you know, your allocation policy, you're operating by percent or by NAV and across certain groups of accounts and it's fine. But the problem arises when things get just a bit complicated. Uh, and if the OMS can't handle those complications or if you don't have an OMS and you're booking things in an accounting system that has some kind of allocation fun function, if the allocations aren't cookie cutter and the OMS can't handle you know, the way that you allocate, what that does is it creates an oversized number of quote unquote manual trades. They're not actually manual. They follow the allocation policy. Somebody did something in a spreadsheet. Um, everything uh, is, you know, is above board, but according to the OMS or the accounting system, you know, it's, it's marked as manual. Uh, you'll have problems uh, oftentimes if you have large differences in sizes between accounts, but if you're trading securities that aren't as liquid as others, you're going to, you're going to encounter minimum sizes, uh, compliance uh, rules that block an allocation, or maybe they block just enough of the allocation that then the minimum size check blocks the allocation. In those cases, having you know an, an OMS follow even the simplest rounding rules can uh, cause larger firms to get preference 
um, you know, unfairly, uh, which you then, you know, you need to be able to handle that. And you have to handle that with something like round robin allocations or something that tracks who's gotten what uh, on similar trades in the past. And these are not simple functions for an OMS to handle. And if it doesn't handle that, then once again, you're putting things down as manual allocations. Um, or you may not be allocating two percentages or NAVs. You may be allocating based off of risk weightings or off of, uh, you know, modeling, uh, matching to a model or, you know, or some other kind of target. Uh, or you may have uh, multiple trades in the same security at different prices. And the more illiquid the market you're trading, you might have, you might uh, trade, you know, the same trade three times with different prices. And then you go and you allocate three times using the out-of-box functionality of the OMS. And at the end of that, you end up giving one fund more uh, more of the trade that had the more advantageous price. Uh, and that, you know, that can cause some disparity. And if you can't document why that's happening, then it's definitely ripe for being flagged as a uh, potential cherry pick. So Those Johan, are some of the things find, you encounter. Do you find that certain uh, system uh, deficiencies or challenges arise from certain investment strategies or, you know, different asset types? Yeah, for sure. So, so the, the two kind of categories where um, where allocation is going to be a challenge, the categories of security types are um, are things that are more liquid in general are going to cause problems. Bank debt, uh, credit, private equity, uh, anything where you tend to have large trades, those trades tend to be in large blocks for liquidity reasons. Uh, and so that that will often you know raise uh, allocation issues um, to the fore. And then there's other security types where based on because of how OMSs and accounting systems have to book them, um, you may have challenges around dealing with how you allocate multiple contracts of credit default swaps or futures or you know or anything else that uh, has to be booked in terms of contracts when the way that you think about it from an allocation standpoint is really allocating the thing, not individual contracts of the thing. Great. Now let's take a look at it from a, a professional services consulting standpoint. Johan, from a consulting, a technology consulting standpoint, do you find that certain technologists have trouble translating the allocation policy to a system? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, allocations and compliance are, you know, kind of two areas of functionality in most systems. Uh, they really ought to be operating uh, together. And allocation policies tend not to be written in a, you know, in, in a very numerical way. Sometimes uh, allocation policies can be hard to understand. So when implementing, you know, when implementing systems, you need a professional services team or a consulting group that understands, you know, what's going on very well and can translate the allocation policy into a, you know, to a kind of a robust map of how this is going to work at all areas of the trading life cycle. And if there's something that could be, uh, you know, that, that, that could be fuzzy or difficult to understand, the, you know, they need to know how to ask the right questions. Okay, thanks, Johan. Greg, compliance departments at times need to do certain things to ensure the compliance program is being properly implemented. At times when perhaps there are system deficiencies, do you find that they have to put in place manual processes and procedures uh, and checks and balances to overcome you know, certain deficiencies? Yeah, it's a good question. Before I get to that, Craig, I wanna go back to something that the Johan said about specific asset classes or investment strategies. You mentioned the credit, you know, uh, trade claims, bank debt, et cetera and private equity. One of the places we see it also on the compliance side is outsourced chief compliance officers or OCIOs and, and fund to fund managers where they have, you know, capacity constraints with their underlying managers and where those particular, you know, fund investments are made. So we see a little bit of struggle there. I just wanted to, to mention that quickly. Um, in terms of your, your question, yeah, I mean, tech, technology is obviously the way to go, but if you're not, if you're, if you don't have the technology, you're not comfortable with the technology, um, you know, we see and, and certainly recommend shadow or forensic testing when it comes to these limitations. For compliance teams that, that don't trust a compliance engine that's a, or a, a, an allocation engine that's in place, they're likely to have periodic testing protocols to ensure that they're running correctly. 
uh, or even worse, some might require compliance review and approval of any out of the box allocations before proceeding to, to Johan's earlier point. So, I mean, to answer your question, yes, without a trustworthy system in place, compliance teams are taking a tremendous amount of time to get this right. I mean, this can add, you know, you know bodies to the compliance teams, additional full-time employees, just to make sure that the allocation process is done correctly on the front end. Great, thanks, Greg. So you touched on forensic testing. So let me hand this to Johan. Have you seen uh, forensic testing in different systems get adopted uh, in the industry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, as, as Greg's saying, sometimes you just may have a, you know, you may have a, a large volume of trades or you may have at some point had challenges around how things are allocated uh, because it's not just having the right system, it's also having it implemented correctly. Um, and so what we're seeing is interest in two kinds of things. One is um, surveillance, you know, systems that will use modern machine learning and data science technology to kind of scan your allocations and identify ones uh, that are outliers uh, algorithmically. Um, you know, the ACA's decryptic system is, is one such system. Uh, the other type of thing is uh, back testing. Uh, sometimes back testing of allocations is done as a like a technology project uh, by consulting companies, um, or it's you know even more expensively it might be done uh, manually. Uh, but if you want to consistently back test all of uh, all of your trades, it, uh, we're seeing interest in products that will take you know a certain range of of trades and rerun the allocations based off of everything that was true as of that date and see if the allocations come up the same way. Thanks, Johan. On the next slide, Greg, can you take a, a couple of minutes and just talk through best practice from a compliance officer's point of view? Yeah, sure, Craig. Um, I, I wanna go back again to something that the Johan said though. Um, Look, I think it's from a compliance perspective, you know, before we just get into the, the best practices, even if you have a robust trade allocation engine or an order management system that, that handles your allocation systematically, um, I think it's still important to trust but verify. So yeah, the Cryptex is, is a sophisticated system that does a bunch of uh, look back testing, but even if you don't have a, a system in place on the back end, it's still important that compliance teams trust but verify at least on a periodic basis to ensure things are, are working smoothly. Um, and, and then in terms of you know, best practices, again, this is about treating clients fairly and having documentation to support the process, especially if there's subjectivity in the allocation process. And typically, when we're talking about the asset classes or investment strategies that we're talking about, there is subjectivity for, for various reasons. Um, you know, and anything other than pro rata, and pro rata can take a number of different forms, whether it's assets or percentages, et cetera, um, you know, compliance officers should be requiring their investment teams to document their allocation decisions prior to execution. We talked about there's no real rules around allocation. There's books and records requirements that really get to the spirit of allocation and having those trade tickets, which indicate, you know, who's being allocated what before execution is certainly important. And then uh, I think Johan mentioned this a minute ago, changes do happen from time to time. And there's not necessarily anything wrong or or uh, you know, right with fraudulent behavior when those happens, but the documented rationale around those exceptions needs to be robust and kept. Great, thanks, Greg. So, Johan, can you talk a little bit about how you can achieve some of these items through the proper implementation of an order management system such as PBI? Sure. Um, back to something that Greg was saying. Um, with um, you know, I absolutely agree that you know you want to you want to trust but verify, right? You need to have kind of human eyes looking at things, um, and the best thing to do for that is not to completely depend on your technology, but make sure the technology is um, is helping you avoid noise or helping you avoid having to do manual work and producing what it is that you're verifying. So if you've got systems that are, you know, that are uh, producing things in, in a common consistent format, and you have the ability to dig into everything uh, in one place, then it's going to be a lot easier. Uh, the people who are who are verifying this in the compliance department and compliance consulting firms, et cetera, are going you know are going to not spend a lot of time looking at spreadsheets and saying, is this the right version of the spreadsheet? What does this field mean? Uh, they're going to uh, be able to spend more of their time uh, doing the actual uh, verifying and checks. 
When implementing uh, an order management system, the most important thing is to, uh, you know, especially when coming up with your allocation best practices, um, uh, sorry, your allocation policies within, uh, within the firm, uh, is to evolve, involve operations and tech in those discussions early uh, to make sure that you're not, um, you're not uh, asking for things that might be hard to achieve or that you don't, that you're not, not necessarily aware of the cost of achieving that. You know, for example, it, our allocation policy says that we need to capture the time of the order, even in our illiquid trades. Well, what happens if all those orders are being done over the phone? Um, what happens uh, if they're being done in various chats where you could theoretically get that, the, you know, that chat information, but can you, how do you do that? What's that going to cost? Uh, it's really important that, um, you know, that, that everybody's on board with those uh, so that you're not, um, you're not kind of coming into the end of your implementation and realizing that you need to do something that may uh, add, you know, months of time and, and lots of money to, you know, to your overall implementation. Uh, another thing is uh, to make sure that that features are not check the box features. So mo a lot of systems have audits and they'll have audits of trading or security master information, but do those audits properly handle different versions of trades after modifications and cancel corrects? Uh, if they do, is everything being audited? Um, maybe you're only, maybe you have, uh, Maybe you have your compliance information in one place and you have the, you know, the different versions of the trades in another place, but you can't pull up what were the allocations in the first few version of the trade or what did compliance, well, what did the portfolio compliance return uh, in the snapshot and how link, linked are these things uh, to one another. So those are all important things to do when, uh, when doing the implementation. Thanks, Johan. I'll just I'll just add to that those chats can be absolutely disastrous because they're never in a consistent format. So, you know, pulling them from a compliance perspective, even for internal testing, can be an absolute nightmare. Thanks, Great. Greg. The, the next slide and a recurring theme throughout the course of this presentation has been process, testing, documentation, and disclosure. Greg, can you just recap for the audience really some of the most important highlights? Yeah, and I, I kind of want to work backwards here from your slide. So disclosure is really first and foremost. That is what clients and investors see. They don't, you know, they don't often dig into policy and procedures and workflow documents. So disclosure first and, and foremost, and then documentation. And the documentation, I guess, is through both the policy but also the, the process. So ideally, of course, you have systems in place. But if you can't have technology, and and I mean. And technology might not be appropriate for every investment advisor and the investment strategies they run. So if you can't have technology, then process and testing become key to ensuring that you know one client is not favored over another. Um, and I should know, I mean, going back to the, the enforcement case we discussed, you know, that firm maybe didn't have a ton of compliance sophistication and didn't really understand why they were doing what they were doing was wrong. But it doesn't only happen intentionally, right? Firms get caught up um, just due to the fact that regulators can play Monday morning quarterback or have the benefit of hindsight, if over a, a certain period of time, and, and, and keep in mind that examination periods can be 12 months, they can be 24 months, it can be 18 months, you know, they have a, a period of time to look at. And if certain clients continue to receive favorable trades, even unintentionally, you can land in some hot water and some difficult uh, situations to, to explain. Thanks, Greg. Okay, now moving on. Johan, can you recap for the audience allocations and compliance functionality that is really critical uh, to an order management system implementation? Yeah, sure. Uh, so what's on the slide is, is, is uh, all, uh, all a, a very good comprehensive list. Uh, I'm not going to recap everything, uh, but the things I want to highlight are, number one, if you need uh, pre-trade uh, portfolio construction to be part of, to part of your policy, Make sure that you're bringing on a system where they actually work for you. Uh, so many of these, uh, you know, portfolio construction and rebalancing screens are uh, often quite limited to operate in only one particular way. And if there's one tiny way in which they don't work, you're going to stop using them and you're going to start doing all of that, all of that uh, portfolio construction work in spreadsheets and, um, and you know, and, and lose that core compliance integration uh, into that process. Um, as I've said a, a couple times before, uh, make sure that, uh, you know, that 
the technology helps you avoid false manual allocations. Uh, the fewer manual fewer allocations that are marked as manual, the more accurate you're uh, you're going to be. And make sure that those you know that you have that you're avoiding those false manual allocations uh, by make sure that everything's integrated. So if you've got a fully functional and robust uh, portfolio compliance engine that can handle pre-trade, uh, post-trade, SMA rules, FORDIAC rules, USITs, all the different kinds of rules, excuse me, <coughs> all in one system, then, and all of that is integrated into your allocation process, then um, you're going to be able to actually incorporate uh, compliance into what you're doing. Um, not everybody has this function, but the ability to replay an allocation through the compliance engine in order to backtest is pretty crucial. Um, and <coughs> if you are allocating uh, for certain kinds of accounts like 40 act funds, you need to be able to produce a real-time snapshot. Um, producing a real-time snapshot and having it actually integrated into your allocation engine, into your compliance, is not a trivial task. And you need to, if this is something that you need, you need to make sure that your allocation, that your allocation process and the OMS that's that's providing it can uh, can actually do this. And of course, um, yeah, I, I mentioned before audit. You need to be able to have audit of everything and not just be able to allocate it where you have to call a developer to uh, go and produce some kind of raw audit information. You really need to be able to access it through the system, looking through all the raw data and looking through a series of reports. Thanks, Johan. Okay, let's move on to uh, Q&A. We had a, a few questions uh, submitted. Uh, first question was, how should an investment manager handle allocations that deviate from the policy and procedures? Let's start with uh, Greg on that one. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, you know, maybe contradicts with, with what Johan said a minute ago, but manual allocations happen, right? You want to minimize them and with a, a good solution in place, you know, you can um, kind of predict what what those allocations might look like in the future. So, um, you know, first and foremost, predicting them, I think, I think is key. But when they happen from, uh, like Johan mentioned, from a, from a technology perspective, but from a compliance perspective, there needs to be document rationale. That, that rationale should, should ideally take place pre-trade, but if not, you need to have a good understanding, the compliance teams need to have a good understanding of why it was allocated the way it was and then it made sense and it didn't um, you know, treat any one client better, better than the next. That, where that documentation resides really doesn't matter, but having the ability to pull that documentation when the SEC is throwing your transaction blotter through their need system and, and pulling out anomalies, you need to be able to quickly pull that documentation. And, you, and ideally, you need to be able to get it from, from the same place so that you're not saying, well, uh, I know I have this documentation, but it's in my email. Oh wait, we just switched Office 365. I don't have that email anymore. So you really want it to be in the system. Okay. And yes, manual allocations will happen. And um, so I, I, you know, I keep coming back to avoiding false positives so that you can find the real manual allocations and make sure that you have proper documentation on them ahead of time before someone asks for something. Thanks, Johan. The, the next question that was submitted has to do with an investment manager that adds a new account or an SMA. How, how might that impact the trade allocation process? We'll start with Greg. Yeah. Um, so defer again to Johan on how to implement this from a technology perspective, but from a compliance perspective, uh, all of your policies and procedures are supposed to be living and breathing documents. So, and, and this happens, I mean, just, uh, just given the, the market volatility in, in March and April, um, you know, we've seen a number of kind of long, short or, or long only equity clients uh, kind of towing into the credit space and right. They have a compliance policy and a workflow document around trade allocations purely for equities. Now they've taken on a separate mandate, a new fund, a new SMA in the, in the credit space that requires kind of scrapping your existing, uh, trade allocation policy and, and developing new, you know, workflow diagrams and, and policy and procedure language. Um, so it's important that, and, and I'll say not only in, in terms of trade allocation, but when you're, you know, taking on a new mandate or, you know, maybe it's just a separately managed account, an existing mandate, you need to take a fresh look at all your compliance policies and procedures. Think about best execution, evaluation, but of course, trade allocations too. 
And from a technology standpoint, uh, the main thing is just that you have enough flexibility in your allocation process to be able to account for things like ramp up. So there's a thing called X weighting that many allocation systems will do where it says, okay, for the first, you know, X number of uh, days or weeks of an account's existence, they get a two, 200%, uh, 300% allocation relative to other funds. This is done consistently across, you know, across all investments. And of course that needs to account for, you know, compliance breaches, but, um, but this is how it's going, how it's going to work. If you've got that functionality within your system, then that means that for those first, uh, you know, a couple weeks or even months is that you don't suddenly have all of your allocations suddenly go manual because you need to be able to do this ramp up. Uh, or maybe it operates until the gross market value gets to, it gets to a certain point. And so if you, if this is applied consistently and the path forward is defined ahead of time, uh, then having the OMS be able to model that is um, is really a, a core function and that way uh, and that way you'll be able to um, handle new accounts very smoothly same thing applies if an account is closing or decides to um, you know decides to go away or decides to uh, to redeem uh, you may you may need to have the same kind of thing to be able to do ramp downs okay we're just about out of time uh, in fact we're about five minutes over I'd like to thank Greg and Johan for participating on this webinar. Uh, if you submitted a question that we weren't able to get to, either Portfolio BI or ACA, we'll be in touch. But again, I'd like to thank all of our participants today, and we look forward to seeing everyone at our next event. Thank you.